please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, Ashok Leland reported what was a superb set of numbers. The revenue jumped by around 57% this quarter. Sonia is here to tell us more about the numbers this time round. Sonia, Monique. Hi, morning. Yes, it's been a stellar set of numbers for Ashok Leyland. Almost a 60% jump, as you rightly pointed out, in the revenues this time around. Coming in at 7,100 odd crores. We were expecting this, you know, because the volumes were so strong this quarter. More than a 40% jump is what we saw in volumes. There was a, 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 there, there were a couple of things that took place. One, I remember um, uh, all the commercial vehicles have to mandatorily have air conditioner cabins in, their, in the vehicles uh, from the 1st of Jan 2018. So there was a lot of pre-buying that we saw in the months of November and December, that aided to volumes. Apart from that, uh, post-GST, there was a revival in buying decisions by the fleet operators. Put together, this boosted the overall volumes. In fact, we did see, you know, the MHCV volumes go up by 41%, LCV volumes went up by 45 odd percent, and the product mix has been very good. So the realizations were also very strong this time, going up by 11% on a year-on-year -year basis and double-digit margins for the company. The company in the past has said that, you know, we might not be able to hold on to these double-digit margins because of raw material pressures, but the entire sector is facing that. X of that, these numbers are looking very good. All right, Sonia, but stay with us for a tad bit longer. From the auto pack, we also have Bajaj Auto that will be reporting their numbers. What do we expect there, Sonia? Well, Nigel, you know, the stock is at a record high. It's had a smooth run over the last six to eight months. We're expecting a good showing this quarter. Uh, the volume growth was healthy. It was about 18% on a year-on-year -year basis. The revenues went uh, are expected to go up by about 24-odd percent to come in at 6,250-odd crores. Uh, the company has been maintaining their margins around this 90 to 20% 20, uh, 20 mark, and that's something that will be uh, held this quarter as well. Now, this quarter, around two things have happened. Export growth has picked up significantly and within exports it's three wheelers which have done really well so the export market grew almost 26 percent and um, three wheelers domestic three wheelers were up 100 percent and exports were up 48 percent however on the flip side the domestic motorcycle segment has slumped quite a bit most of their new launches, whether it's the Dominar, whether it's the Avenger, have not done well at all. The V series has not done well. That's actually taken down their domestic market share. However, they've managed to make that up by doing very well in exports and three wheelers. And since three wheelers is a high margin business, they are going to see a sequential improvement in margins to 19% uh, or so. Realizations also expected to improve a tad bit. Back to you. Okay, all right, Sonia. Thanks very much for that. Well, the biggest voices from India Inc. have spoken to CNBC TV 18 to give their verdict on Finance Minister Arun Jaitley's budget. Uh, let's listen in. The biggest impact of this budget is that it's actually very holistic in its approach of one, looking at various segments in the economy, and the second is looking at both the social and the and the investment needs. So, what I mean by this is that you know it talks of uh, it talks of the rural economy, it talks of senior citizens, it talks of uh, you know the younger economy in terms of uh, technology-oriented uh, solutions and so on. What he has done, he had to do. Particularly, everyone expected and it was known that emphasis will be on the rural economy, emphasis will be on the, on the farmers, health, education, infrastructure. I don't think uh, it's not a slippage. I would say it is maintaining the 3.5 fiscal deficit as last year. It, it, it is not worsened. And uh, he did say that the economic reforms are rewarding but very challenging. It's because of these challenging, the major structural reforms they have undertaken, some of this fiscal deficit may not have been, uh, may not have been achieved. I think 8 to 10,000 crores is a fair estimate of the premium that will be required to cover 100 families. You cannot have inclusive economic development without health coverage and this universal health care is welcome news, long overdue. And I'm really, really pleased that the government has finally made this bold move. Make in India was somewhat uh, hidden uh, inside many things. <clears throat> and there is uh, quite a bit about Make in India uh, in this budget. There is a uh, uh, allocation for uh, National Manufacturing Competitive Council. Uh, there is uh, things on jobs and skill development. There is things on smart city. 
IT and electronics, uh, hardware development. So a lot of things were built in uh, for Make in India, though there's nothing which is large by itself that's going to make a huge difference immediately. But generally positive direction for Make in India. If well implemented, these policies could help both consumer products demand growth and agri-products demand growth. So we see benefits for companies like Goodrich Consumer Products, for Goodrich AgroVet, and <clears throat> I think they're good provisions, but they must be implemented well. Well, uh, let's shift focus to the metal space now. We have Novellis, which reported its earnings already. Uh, Nigel, what are the highlights? And uh, Hindaku would be in focus as well. Absolutely. Let's start off with Novellis because they came out with a set of numbers and the numbers look quite good. Remember the last few quarters, it's been improving. And this quarter as well, no difference. So top line, we had a growth of around 33%. Look pretty good. 300, uh, around $3 billion approximately. The shipments, that came in higher by around 6%. But important to note that both South America as well as North America, over there we had a bit of a volume growth. And in addition to that, you had higher volumes coming in from the auto space. Remember, in fact, that's been the big focus uh, area. So we had, um, you know, the auto shipments, that jumped up by around 12%. The facility in China, that jumped up. And that's what will help the overall profitability. And that's perfectly replicated. Because the EBITDA per ton, over there, in fact, that uh, did come in higher by close to around 13% uh, approximately. That came in at around $377 uh, dollars, uh, per ton. Why is that? You know, it benefits from operating leverage. Better operating efficiencies did play out. And finally, the price to cost spread, now that's moved up to around $550 per ton. And that definitely helps their cause. Uh, so besides an operational performance, you also had the profit number that more than doubled. But that was partly helped because you know, of the uh, of, uh, lower taxes that are going to be prevalent now in the United States. And secondly, there was a non-cash uh, you know, uh, uh, income uh, tax benefit of around $34 million. So you need to keep that in mind. But besides the numbers, you know, the management has said that in fact the net debt to EBITDA ratio, that's come down to around 3.2. I remember a time when they were targeting 3.5. So they have already achieved that, now they moved lower. So they are all set in case they want to do some inorganic acquisition, they can go ahead and do that. And also in terms of guidance, well, the EBITDA for the year, they are guiding at the upper end of around $2 billion approximately. Well, coming to um, you know Hindalco's numbers today, what do we expect uh, there? Should come in at around lunchtime, top line growth of around 18%. Remember, base metal prices have been on a tear, so that's what helps them. They'll basically benefit because of higher realizations as well as higher volumes. So that's going to be quite important. In terms of aluminum, what kind of a number you're looking at in terms of sales? 325,000 to around 330,000. That's in terms of uh, aluminum. In terms of copper, around 100,000. That's something that the street is looking at. Good top line growth, but operating profit should grow up uh, by close to around 14%. Margin should be more or less stable at around 12%. What influences that? Higher input costs, that's point number one. Coal costs have gone up, carbon costs as well have gone up. But what doesn't help them is that they have, uh, you know, uh, alumina prices that have spiked up as well, Ekta. Well, let's go across to Mangala Malo. He's standing by to tell us what are the cues coming in from the derivatives market. Mangala. Well, good morning, Nigel. You know, uh, the one thing that really stands out is the fact that the FIIs, they uh, sold in index futures while they bought in the cash market. And after budget, we've been talking about the volatility index rising. So after budget yesterday, post the event was off, the India WIX, that one should come up for you, was down by about 11%, telling you that the IVs have come off on both the call side as well as the put side. The FIIs, while they added about 1,100 crores in uh, in the cash markets, they pulled out some money from the index futures space. Uh, now the, uh, the FII long exposure stands at a around that 69-70% mark as compared to 80% at the start of this series. We saw that in the Nifty Futures Premium also, which came off from about 27-28 points down to 14 points, even as we recovered from the low point of the day. What really stood out was the selling in index options, close to around 750 crore worth selling in index options. While internally, it could be a bit of a mishmash given yesterday was also Nifty Bank weekly options expiry. The one thing that stood out is that there were a lot of shorts added in index calls, and that was reflected in the Nifty PCR as well. The put call ratio is now at 1.2. That compares to about 1.3. And just last series, we had uh, levels of almost 1.8. So uh, some hedges coming out by on the upside. The mid-cap underperformance telling you that maybe the upside is slightly limited. We saw some call action in 10, 11,500 as well as 11,400. 11,000 put was also fairly active in yesterday's trading session. So it'll be very interesting to see how it goes by going forward given the sort of setup that we have especially on the options side back to you okay all right manglam thanks very much for that well 
with the fiscal shortfall for FI19 pegged at around 3.3% from an estimated 3.5% for the current period, Ravi Bhatia of S&P Rating Services believes that even though they expected some fiscal slippage, they did not expect it to be so significant. We know that this is an, uh, an, a pre-election uh, budget, um, so we sort of expected some uh, fiscal slippage. Um, so we've kind of factored that into our overall uh, 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 analysis on, on India. Um, but, you know, it, it's still a concern that, they, uh, that uh, there was quite a significant fiscal slippage. And the question is also what this will uh, indicate to the states, uh, because, you know, we look at the fiscal deficit on a consolidated basis uh, with the states as well. Um, so going into the, uh, in the, in the year before the election, uh, the combined uh, deficit. So that was a bit of a concern. We're entering into a new environment with higher oil prices, um, you know, and India being a, a net oil importer, whether that uh, is going to have an impact on growth. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we've just come out of this uh, rather poor growth uh, year. Um, so the question is, will the rebound happen? It's not entirely clear. Uh, the GST uh, is still the teething problems around that. They continue. Um, so it's really not entirely clear whether they can uh, meet their revenue targets as well. And Ratan Roy of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council believes that the government has reverted to slower fiscal glide path earlier than expected. Let's hear him out. Obviously what has happened is that the calibration of the fiscal roadmap uh, has changed somewhat in terms of its time duration. Uh, because last year we would have been at, uh, if, we had, if, we had, if we had kept to three, then we would have been at three last year, there would have been a pause this year. Uh, but we decided to go to 3.2. Now, there's no denying it, uh, we haven't achieved 3.2 uh, this year, so we are at 3.5, and therefore the government has perhaps decided to have a sort of slower light path to fiscal consolidation than originally envisaged. Okay, and on that note, we're going to wrap up this edition of Power Breakfast, but stay tuned, Bazaar Morning Call is up next um, to take all the ac action forward. Stay tuned.